All right, good day. Welcome to Poland, apparently. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, my talk is going to be about Angular and the OWASP top 10. Who here knows the OWASP top 10? All right, quite a handful, about a third of the room. In case you don't know the OWASP top 10, this is a list of the 10 most risky vulnerabilities in web applications. It's a document produced by OWASP, a nonprofit, aiming to improve the current state of security in web applications. And they built this new version of the top 10 every couple of years, and it's essentially an overview of the most dangerous things you should be worried about as a developer. It's not about the most common vulnerabilities, not about the most easy to exploit, it's a combination of all of those factors. So you can imagine that things like SQL injection and command injection rank very highly. They are unfortunately still very common, they are fairly easy to exploit, and the impact of such a vulnerability is really high. In this talk, I want to talk about what this means for Angular applications. I want to talk about the OWASP top 10 in the context of an Angular application. And I kind of think I don't need to tell you how Angular works. So you have an Angular app, you deploy this to the browser, well, to a server, you load it in the browser, you might want to load some files from a CDN, you might want to use uh, an authentication service, let's call it single sign-on or whatever uh, it is you're using something along those lines. Obviously, you're going to have a backend that does something useful, and uh, by the end of the talk, we're also going to talk about NPM. That's essentially uh, the architecture, if you want to call it that, um, what I want to talk about in this presentation. You can imagine that this is about Angular, but it also holds for the other single-page application frameworks. They're going to do things a bit differently, but the major concepts there apply to those things as well. But we're going to talk about Angular in a minute. First, I want to introduce myself. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Carmen. My name is Philippe de Rijk. I'm from Belgium, so it's a kind of a home game for me. That's easy. And I'm a, I'm a security expert. So I train developers on building more secure applications. So I essentially travel the world under my name of my company called Pragmatic Web Security, where I teach developers how to do things more securely, what the, the complex mechanisms mean, what security mechanisms, mechanisms are available, and things like that. If you're interested in security, talk to me later. Um, I also do uh, architectural security reviews if you're interested in that. And I'm the co-organizer of the SecUpDev course, which is a week-long course in Leuven in February every year. And you have a flyer of that in your goodie bag because the conference was nice enough to hand those out. So thank you for that. And that's enough about me. Let's talk about security. One of the first things, um, well, to be fair, this is going to be an overview talk. They gave me 30 minutes. You can imagine that doing an in-depth security talk in 30 minutes is next to impossible. So I want to give you an overview of how things relate together. I want to give you a few pointers of things to figure out, uh, additional resources. And if you have any questions, I'll be here the rest of the day. So please talk to me um, about this or about other security things. That's perfectly fine. First topic we need to talk about is the network. You see all of these uh, arrows here, which is essentially all network traffic. Of course, today you know that networks are considered to be insecure. Everybody is on a Wi-Fi network, like the one here, the one from the hotel, your mobile phone network, all of those networks are considered fairly untrusted. So attackers would, in principle, be able to intercept traffic, to modify traffic on the fly, and things like that. So these things aren't too far-fetched anymore today, and the solution we have for that is HTTPS. So you should deploy everything over HTTPS, even internally. Um, you cannot take any risks or any chances or assumptions that the network is trusted. HTTPS used to be one of these topics that people are like, yeah, but it's really too hard and too, it costs too much for my application, I don't need it. Well, today those arguments aren't very valid anymore because we have something like Let's Encrypt. Let's Encrypt is a certificate authority hosted by a nonprofit that actually offers free certificates for everybody who wants them. They're free, they automated the whole process, it's super easy to set up and it works really well. Who here is using Let's Encrypt? Awesome. Who is donating to Let's Encrypt? <laughs> Crickets. <laughs> Honestly, if your company is using that, convince them to donate. It doesn't run on air, it runs by, it's run by people on real hardware and they have real expenses, so help other people um, or help them build a better and more secure web. That's my two cents here. I'm not going to go into depth on HTTPS, but a few things that you might want to know for your Angular application. Let's talk about the front-end part first. If you want to load your Angular app, your user is not going to type HTTPS colon slash slash restograde.com, for example. No, you just, just type restograde.com and stuff just works. Well, the just works part is because somebody has configured a server to redirect the user to HTTPS. So the browser is going to send an HTTP request by default, and the server is going to tell the browser, look, man, I know what you're trying to do, but we want to use HTTPS. Please go there and load the secure version of my application. This is something you need to do. If you don't do that, 
First of all, either people are going to use the HTTP version, or if you don't support HTTP, you're going to get a connection error, which is also not very pretty. So this is a by default mechanism that people who deploy HTTPS have been using for ages to actually get people to the HTTPS version of the website. There's a but here. This matters for browser-based traffic, where you actually have this HTTP request first and then need to go to HTTPS. If you're using an API, you don't need this mechanism because your API will be contacted over HTTPS directly. You can simply tell people my API endpoint is HTTPS whatever. And there's no redirect going on. There's no HTTP request first. So whenever you are deploying an API on an endpoint that doesn't host any front-end resources, you can actually disable HTTP altogether. And you don't need to support this whole redirect mechanism. That's one of the things that you might want to consider to improve your security or uh, make your deployment even easier. So that's one of the benefits there that you can follow. If you want to verify how good a job you have done deploying HTTPS or how good a job of your operations team have been, has been doing, you can run this test called the SSL server test. So you can see that my website scores really well. Um, I take zero credit for that because it's hosted by Netlify and they configure everything. So I just hit a button, enable HTTPS, and they do everything else, but they do apparently, they do a very good job, which is good for me since I do security, so it would be shameful if it would have been a C or whatever. One thing that's kind of relevant here, apart from all the details in the server test, there's pages and pages of details, so please check it out. You can see here that they give me extra points for enabling strict transport security. And that's a mechanism that you need to tell the browser that it should always use HTTPS when he visits your website. So that's definitely something to enable. If you're using HTTPS anyway, it's not that hard, and it buys you additional security against network-based attacks. Again, no more details here. If you want to know more, I think um, I did a talk for uh, the Ordina Join conference uh, earlier this year uh, where I talked about these mechanisms in detail, and the video is online, so you can find it there and take a look at what it means in practice. Brings us to the first overview slide. So sensitive data exposure is the OWASP top 10 item. It's about exposing data, in this case, on the network. <coughs> and the solution there is to support HTTPS everywhere. Even internally on your own company network, it's, uh, today it's a best practice to enable HTTPS. The only place where you can get away with that is an actual on-machine network. If you have like a virtual setup where you have one server with different virtual servers, between those things it might be okay not to use HTTPS, but it costs you almost nothing to do it anyway there as well. Verify your HTTPS deployment, very important. And if you have HTTPS deployed, ensure that you have HSTS enabled as well. It's really necessary to step up security there. All right, one down, a couple more to go. So um, let's keep digging on. If you have your application, one of the first things you probably want to do is start uh, communicating with your backend to do something useful, to make some state changing operations. You're going to need some, <coughs> some way to relay kind of authorization information. Who, who is making the call? Um, should this be allowed? Yes or no? And one of the common ways to do this is to use an authentication service to authenticate the user and obtain some kind of an access token or an authorization state token or session object or whatever you want to call it. Let's take a closer look at these aspects. So if you authenticate to a service, a single sign-on service, an authentication service, or if you're using OAuth or OpenID Connect, it's going to be an authorization server. It doesn't matter in what form it comes to. It usually works in kind of a similar mechanism. And what you, there, what you do there is the user is going to enter credentials to authenticate him or herself. And in return, you probably get a cookie. And the cookie there is used to manage a session between the browser and the single sign-on service. That's what enables this single sign-on mechanism. That's what allows the service to remember you next time some application sends you there to authenticate and be like, oh yeah, I still remember you uh, because of your cookie and I know who you are. Whether how exactly that works doesn't matter. What I want to talk about here is quickly, I want to mention these cookie security properties. This is a way to set a cookie. And there are some flags you need to take into account. You need to add a secure flag telling the browser this should only be used on HTTPS connections. You need to add the HTTP-only flag to tell the browser hide this thing from JavaScript. Those are uh, fairly well known. They uh, have been around for like 10 to 15 years, I think. This one is new. There's a prefix you can add to the name of the cookie. And that prefix tells the browser to handle that cookie more strictly. There's actually two prefixes. There's the host prefix and the secure prefix. In this case, it's underscore underscore host dash whatever the name of the cookie is, and that suffices for the use case here. <coughs> if you want to know more, again, um, the documentation of this is mechanism is not too complicated, so you can check it out what this actually means and whether you need to use the host or the secure prefix. But you need to add these flags to your cookie mechanism, so this matters if you're deploying this yourself or if you're configuring an authorization server. You might want to set these things up correctly. 
And then the second step is when, you, uh, are authentic when the user is authenticated, your application actually needs some kind of a token from that service to access the API. That's the whole purpose of what we're doing here. Again, the, the details, I'm not going to go into detail on how this works, but I just want to point out a few potential vulnerabilities if you try to implement something like this yourself. So what you're going to do is the browser is going to send a request with the cookie to this SSO service. It's going to see like, oh yeah, that's uh, this user, that's Philip. I'm going to give that application uh, some kind of a token that it can use to access a backend or access another service or something like that. That's essentially the process that's going on. You can see here, um, it's a, a simple GET request. It's an XHR request coming from JavaScript. It's an API call, essentially, to that service in this case. What matters here is that that service is properly secured. In this case, it's an XHR call. It's going to go to a different origin. So the browser will add this origin header. It will tell the service, hey, man, I'm coming from here. I'm making the request from restorgrade.com, from HTTPS. Do you want to allow that, yes or no? And if so, uh, please give me uh, a token, essentially. It's really important, this is course cross-origin resource sharing. It's really important that that service locks this down. Otherwise, if somebody makes a request from another context, for example, maliciousfood.com, which you can guess is not a good site, the service might issue that site a token as well, which is probably not what you want and which would cause a major vulnerability. And again, this is, a, in this case, it would be a course misconfiguration and it would definitely be something you might want to take into account. Examples like this have happened in real systems. There has been a, a cryptocurrency wallet system where they actually had this endpoint wide open so anybody in the browser of the user could request a token and get access to that wallet and steal a lot of money. Well, it's less money today, but it used to be a lot of money a few months ago. <laughs> you get the idea. And then, of course, if you... Uh, are using a, a predefined product or using existing services, chances are you are using something like OpenID, Connect, or OAuth uh, under the hood. Under the hood, these things, uh, in, in that case, the SSO becomes an authorization server, and there is some interaction between that authorization server and the backend to enable that kind of mechanism. As you can imagine, OAuth is a very complex topic. You have uh, around six to seven different OAuth flows and three different OpenID Connect flows. There's no way I will, I'll be able to talk about that in the time I have here. Just wanted to point out, these things are insanely complex, and you, there a lot of people make mistakes against picking the right flow. I've talked with a few people about this topic uh, during this conference already, um, so please read up on which flow you should use and pay attention to the details. And if at all possible, try to use a library that is, has been well implemented and handles some of the pitfalls out of the box. But the main uh, problem that we see there in real systems is using the wrong flow, which might cause vulnerabilities in an application just by accident. And it's not even a glaring hole. It's not something you will see unless it gets exploited. And then you're like, oh, crap, I did that uh, wrong. So please take that into account and try to read up on that topic or talk to me later if you have some questions. That brings us to the second point, broken authentication. For OWASP, this is something you need to know. For OWASP, authentication is both the authentication procedure, like submitting credentials and stuff like that, and the, the, the keeping track of that authorization state or authentication state using some form of session management. doesn't matter which uh, exactly you're using in your API or your application. If you're using cookies, which you probably are at some point, uh, apply state-of-the-art cookie security mechanisms. I know these things are new. Uh, maybe you cannot even configure them in your framework. In that case, file a bug to tell them, like, hey, man, implement support for prefixes. But if you can, enable those things. Enforce a tight course policy, really important. Only allow legitimate contexts to get access to those tokens. And if you're using OpenID Connect or OAuth, use the proper flow. That is very important in your applications as well. All right, back to our architecture, or architecture, whatever you want to call it. It's not a real architecture diagram anyway. It's a, let's talk about this here. So now we have authenticated our user. We've gotten uh, some form of a token, which we now can use to access our backend. There's a lot of ways to do that. You can transfer that token, token in a cookie. You can put it in, uh, well, you can put it in an authorization header. You can use a JOT, or you can use a session identifier. OAuth has reference tokens and self-contained tokens. Too much stuff to talk about here, so I'm going to refer to you to my talk from last year. Last year, I talked about cookies versus tokens. The video is on YouTube. It's um, actually highly relevant even today, so I'm not going to go into detail there. What I want to talk about here, instead of the, the mechanism, let's talk about authorization itself. Let's talk about a few pitfalls with authorization on the backend, which is essentially the ultimate goal of doing authentication in the first place. You want to authorize calls to the backend. Well. 
If you're doing Angular, this is an article from uh, Jurgen. You might know the guy. He organizes this conference. And he has some pretty good stuff, uh, pretty in-depth articles online. And I took this snippet to show you how uh, authorization is done in an Angular application. This is how you protect routes from being accessed when the user is not signed in. And this is very useful for one purpose, usability. It's not a security feature. And to be fair, the article never claims it's a security feature. But it's, it's never meant for security. Some people, um, I actually talked to someone about that in the workshop yesterday, some people, or not that person, but other persons, have the impression that if you cannot do it from the front end application, it's shielded. Nobody can do it. But you know that there's tools like Postman, there's comment line tools where you can send any request to the backend. And if the backend doesn't enforce any restrictions, you're in a lot of trouble. It's not because Angular can't do it that uh, nobody else can do it if they don't use other techniques. So front end authorization is not a security feature. It's a usability feature. It helps the user to avoid uh, authorization errors like, oh yeah, you're not allowed to do that if you simply hide those features and ask the user to log in. Show you that it's a backend problem. Let's talk about T-Mobile. T-Mobile had a problem a couple of, um, I, I'm not sure when this was, I think a couple of months ago, maybe a year ago already, and they exposed, potentially exposed data on 76 million customers. And what happened is they, they are a mobile phone provider, so they have accounts, and they use the phone number as an identifier for the account, which kind of makes sense if you have, it's kind of a unique identifier anyway, so why not use that? That by itself is not a problem. They even implemented authentication checks. They checked if you were logged in, and if you were not logged in, you could not get access to that information. Good, right? Well, that step was good. And then they forgot the next step. And the next step was checking if the authenticated user is actually the owner of the account he's trying to access. Oops. <laughs> Meaning that if you make an API call, everything works, you get your account information. But if you send the same call from Postman with your authentication information there, your cookie, your token, or whatever you're using, and you modify the phone number to the phone number of your friend, you'll get his account information, which is not a good thing. And apparently this is quite common because Telefonica had the same problem in Spain and AT&T had the same problem in the US. So apparently this is quite a common vulnerability. Brings us to another OWASP issue, broken access control. This, these vulnerabilities are present in applications and they're hard to spot because you don't see them if you look at the code unless you know that you have to look for that. Because there is an authorization check, like is the user signed in? Yes, okay. That's a check, but you have to do additional checks as well. Is the user the owner of the account? Does he have permissions to access this information? Yes or no? And that is often missing. And unless you go looking for that explicitly, it's hard to spot these problems. So remember, client-side access control, good, yes, but for usability, not for security. And backend server-side access control is important, and you'll need to decide how to transfer your authorization information. Whether you use cookies or the authorization header, server-side objects or client-side session objects, they all have their benefits and drawbacks, um, and that is what is covered in the other video. Next topic. You may have noticed this little guy here. Um, it says local storage. Interesting. Something that's often stored in local storage is this, this actual token that you send in the authorization header. But you can also use it to store other data. Today, we have offline applications, so you might uh, want to use that data store to store data in an offline manner. There's also other database, uh, data storage mechanisms like IndexedDB, which is a bit more advanced, but also uh, a lot more difficult to use. Um, so there's plenty of options in the browser. What I want to talk about is that client-side storage mechanisms are insecure by default in the sense that a user can easily go in and grab the data. It doesn't take an advanced user, it's just opening Chrome DevTools and you go to application and then you have local storage and session storage and you can simply access the information that's stored in there. So you should not use that to store sensitive information because if the user can access it, if I get access to your machine, uh, people often do not lock, lock their laptops even in a security workshop, which is surprising but uh, interesting. <laughs> if I would go, if I would go into someone's laptop and go into local storage, I would be able to read that data as well. So if you store something in there that's sensitive, protect it. Encrypting it is one way. An easy way to do that is using JSON Web Tokens. JSON Web Tokens have, by default, a mechanism to encrypt them. It's, admittedly, it's hard or not that trivial to find a good library for your language because it's an advanced feature and not many libraries actually support it, but it is available and it's well, uh, well specified and it's actually, once you have set it up, it's fairly easy to use. But there's also other things you can do. By the way, this only works well if you don't need the data on the client, if it's data you want to store and then send back to the server. If you want to store data on the client itself, um, it might take some more advanced encryption mechanisms to allow the user to access that with, for example, a password that uh, transforms into a key and decrypts the data. But that, again, would take us way too far. 
something you actually can do in your applications, which I strongly recommend, is to compartmentalize your applications. If you're storing sensitive data, it might make sense to isolate that into a separate context so that it cannot easily be compromised if your application gets compromised. And here's how you might do that. So let's say we have an application running on app.restorgrade.com and we have another, um, another context running on private.restorgrade.com. By design, the browser prevents interaction between these contexts. The browser will say, no, 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 you have two different origins. I'm not allowing you to interact, inspect each other's DOM, access each other's JavaScript variables. That is off limits. The only thing you can do is send messages and navigate the frame, but that's not relevant here. You can send messages, sure. You can send messages through an opt-in mechanism. That is perfectly fine. If you look at storage, the inner context, private.restorgrade.com, has access to this storage area. This is associated with its origin, HTTPS, private.restorgrade.com. The outer application here, app, does not have access to this data store. It has access to its own data store if it wants to, but not to the one from the inner frame. Those things are, again, isolated in the browser. And this is where the, the interesting uh, stuff happens. If you need to store a secret, let's say a client-side API key, you can put it in this private data store associated with this context. So only this context running, or only something running on this origin will be able to access this data store, which is a good thing, because if the application here gets compromised, the attacker will not be able to access that key directly. The only thing you enable with this mechanism is, for example, this application can ask this context, hey, send a request to the backend with your key and give me the results. But you have minimized the attack service. You have limited the impact of a potential attack uh, that can happen there. And in this context, you don't run anything else except the code to make these calls to the backend and send the messages. So there's no third-party dependencies, there's no user input being handled, and that essentially gives you more assurances that this code is actually safe and cannot be compromised. One way of doing things, just something to think about. Brings us back to sensitive data exposure. It was about more than HTTPS, it's also about uh, protecting data at rest at the client and on the server. But we're not going to talk about the server because it's Angular here, let's talk about the client. So carefully consider what you share with the client. Because everything you share with the client is potentially stored in an unsafe way. And the same holds for mobile uh, applications, by the way. They have access to a more secure storage, but many simply store data on the device itself. If it's sensitive, encrypt it before sending it to the client. That's one option. And if you are building a web application, use compartmentalization to isolate that logic into a separate context. All right. Let's talk about cross-site scripting. Cross-site scripting is what happens when the attacker injects something into the application which triggers code execution in the browser of the user. It's a very big problem. It's, ranked in the o it's present in the OWASP top 10, and it's a serious issue. I've done a talk about that two years ago, so I'm going to refer you to that one. It's again still relevant, so that's very good. Um, you can find it if you look for NGBE videos on YouTube. Again, no time to go into detail here. Here's the gist of it. For cross-site scripting, Angular automatically applies cross-site scripting defenses, which is absolutely awesome. The only thing you need to do is two things. You need to get out of the way, let Angular do whatever it needs to do, and you need to do things the Angular way. So don't try to mix Angular with server-side templates, or don't try to mix jQuery with Angular, because it's going to end up in a very bad place. Just do it the Angular way, and you're good to go. Use ahead-of-time compilation to avoid template injection, and you're good. There's one set of functions you need to be careful about, and that's bypass security, trust, whatever. Bypass security, trust, HTML. The reason that there's bypass security in a name is because they're dangerous. It doesn't provide any of the automatic protection, so you should only use it for static snippets, never for uh, uh, untrusted input through that function. Keep that in mind. All of these things are good and well to protect your application. But what if your application is simply vulnerable from the start? What if you're including malicious code right there in your application? You're kind of screwed from day one, from code, uh, line, line of code, source, uh, source code line one, and you have a very big problem. And this can happen in two ways. The first way is if you pull in malicious resources from a CDN. If you pull in files from a CDN and the attacker manages to change one of these files, you're in trouble because you're just pulling in malicious code and anything can happen. Ask British Airways. They had this problem a few weeks ago where they actually, uh, somebody stole a lot of customer information, credit card information and stuff like that. And it happened because they had a third-party dependency that they were loading from a remote server, and that one got compromised. The attacker added 22 lines of code. 
And that 22 lines looked for the credit card input form, snag snag snagged the data, and shipped it off to a server somewhere. And it's going to cost them a few million in fines because of the data leakage there. And it could have been prevented. There's a mechanism available today that would have stopped this attack from happening. And that's called sub-resource integrity. Here's how you load a file from a CDN, in case you are not familiar with this mechanism on the web. I'm pretty sure you're good, but uh, I am fully aware, by the way, that you don't load Angular like this, but uh, this is just an example. So you kind of see what we're doing. This is what happens when you load a file. With sub-resource integrity, if the file becomes malicious, the browser will prevent that from being loaded. And the way you do that is by adding this integrity attribute. You add a checksum of the file, so you calculate the checksum on this file, or a CDN simply gives that to you if you want that. <coughs> and then you tell the browser, anything that doesn't match this checksum, reject that. So the browser will check the file, will look at the file, like if, if even a single white space has changed, the checksum will be different, and the browser will be like, screw this, I'm not accepting that. So in the British Airways case, this would have helped to prevent that attack through that mechanism. Of course, it only works well with uh, sort of static files. If you have a file that changes every day, this is not going to be a very useful mechanism. But if, you, if it's a static file, the typically stuff that you store on a CDN or something there, it works really well. And it's really easy to use. And then the last thing we need to talk about is, of course, this NPM thing. What if your NPM packages are malicious? Like, what if uh, the package from last week actually happened in practice, which it did? So this was a problem with NPM. An NPM package became malicious, and it had two million installations. And if you look at what happened, the story is actually depressing. The story was that nobody hacked this. The, somebody just mailed the creator of the package to ask him, like, hey, I want to maintain that package. Is that OK by you? And I was like, yeah, sure, here's the repo. Go ahead. And the attacker got access to the source code repository, added the backdoor, committed that, pushed that to NPM. It got installed everywhere, and everybody started freaking out. And the guy took a lot of shit for that, which is, in my opinion, totally wrong. Because everybody here, this is an indication of a broken ecosystem. We're all building applications with open source libraries that people build in their free time and put on NPM, and everybody uses them and nobody pays them. Until things go wrong, and then everybody's like, come on, man, what the hell are you doing? Or like, hey, man, support this, or do a better job, or this or that. And that is a very troublesome ecosystem, in my opinion. Think about that. But let's not talk about the philosophical sides here. Let's talk about what you can do against these things. One of the things you can do, or NPM already does, is the NPM audit command. So after you run NPM install, it's going to run NPM audit, and it's going to look at your dependencies and tell you that you have 27 vulnerabilities. Whoops. These are vulnerabilities and dependencies. You'll have these even before you have written one line of code. Just by loading some stuff, you are vulnerable. And this is from one of my uh, recent training applications. This thing is eight months old. And it has 27 vulnerabilities. That's insane. You can fix some of them automatically with npm audit fix. That's the minor version updates. You have also major version updates, which will be hard to fix, especially if the dependency is buried like a few levels deep. <coughs> GitHub has a similar feature. The dependency graph, you can easily enable that on your project, and it will send you mails about vulnerabilities. I like this better because it gives me less vulnerabilities. <laughs> no. Actually, this is, this is the most easy way to integrate that into your process. You simply have to click the button, enable this, and GitHub will send you notifications when it discovers vulnerabilities. If you want to run it yourself, OWASP has a tool called Dependency Check. Oh, crap. Um, OWASP has a tool called Dependency Check that uh, also works quite well. I have no idea how to get rid of the VPN thing. My apologies for that. Let me fix that. Security getting in the way, right? Always, Always yes. It's a trade-off between usability and security, so <laughs> let's go for security. Even though the Wi-Fi is turned off, that's why the error actually comes. But nonetheless, OWASP has a tool you can run as well, and you have a lot of third-party commercial solutions that offer similar services as well. And this brings us to the last point, and maybe the most important one. Using components with known vulnerabilities is ranked in the OWASP top 10, and it's a big problem. If it's external files from, files from CDN, sub-resource integrity will be your savior. You can actually use that to prevent the loading of malicious files. For your applications, you should set up dependency checking. It's not that hard. You just need to take the effort to set it up for your applications. And then the final point, include maintenance intervals. You will have to update your application regularly. And if you're building an in-house product, that might be very 
easy to, well, you have to convince management, but it's easy to set it up. But many of you are consultants, meaning that you work for customers, and you'll have to convince those customers that the time that you buy a website and put it online, and 10 years later you do the same thing, are over. If you buy a, build a website today with Angular, you'll need to constantly update that, which is going to cost money, which a customer might not appreciate very much. And I see that as a, a one of the problems that's, uh, that we will face in the future. And by the way, this is about known vulnerabilities. For unknown vulnerabilities, there's nothing we can do, except code reviews of NPM libraries, which uh, nobody ever does anyway. So uh, that's one of the problems that's going to come back to bite us in the future. And that brings me back to the OWASP top 10. This is the top 10, as you can find it uh, delivered by OWASP. Here's a reordering of what this means for Angular. This is a very opinionated uh, reordering based on um, my experience and what I see uh, going on here. So I think that these components with known vulnerabilities are a very big problem that we need to face as soon as possible. And of course, we talked about all the other ones. Um, we can talk about the ordering there. Sure, uh, there's plenty of things going on. Let me wrap it up by saying I have an overview of all, everything I talked about in this Angular security sheet sheet. So it's a sheet sheet about Angular and OWASP top 10. You can grab it from my website. You can find it on my Twitter feed as well. It's easily accessible. So um, you can find a copy uh, later on uh, after the talk. There's a mailing list to subscribe to updates because I regularly issue updates and additional sheet sheets. There's also one on JWT, so that might be interesting as well. And if you only subscribe to the sheet sheets, that's the only mail you get. And if you really hate that email, there's also a link to get the sheet sheet directly without email. That's also fine. And that wraps it up for me. Thank you for listening. I hope this was a good overview of what security means for Angular, especially the most risky issues. Follow me on Twitter for more information to keep up to date and to receive information about cheat sheets and courses and talks and whatever. And enjoy the conference. Thank you very much.